it's quite important that every one of us you know, to understand different points of view and different narratives outside of our own. Even if you disagree on a certain point of view or a certain quote-unquote way of life, I can only hope to inspire people to be empathetic and to have the wisdom to see from a different point of view. This is the Belongings Podcast Series, produced by the ASEAN Soji Caucus with the support of VOICE. Belongings is part of the Southeast Asian Queer Cultural Festival 2021. The series name has three elements. B means to exist. It shines the light on the existence and identity of the LGBTIQ. Longing is inspired by the word karinduan in Bahasa Indonesia or Bahasa Melayu and pangungulila in Filipino. It's the yearning for a region that is caring, inclusive, and respectful of diversity. And lastly, belonging. It stands as a reminder that the LGBTIQ people have always been part of the ongoing memory of the Southeast Asian region. In this episode, we talk to Benedict Lim, a queer migrant. He is a Malaysian writer who is based in Singapore. I did two projects for the Southeast Asian Queer Cultural Festival. The first of it is a literary project, a trilogy of three queer Malaysian migrants celebrating National Day in Singapore. So in that trilogy, I explore the idea of the national, what it means to be a Malaysian in the peak of Singaporean nationalism. So what it means to create a new life in a land that's so familiar to your old one. That actually inspired my event called Journeying Between the Lines, where we talk about the experiences of queer migrants, not just in Malaysia and Singapore, but across the world. So I was very lucky to be able to find um, three speakers. Uh, Jeff Akaba, who is a sort of a community health officer for this non-governmental organization in Bangkok. So he's Filipino. And then there's this Indonesian interdisciplinary art student studying in the Netherlands, as well as Singaporean senior lecturer of sociology in Australia. So we have these people talking about their queer experiences and how even the simplest things can really remind you of home and even strengthen the connection of home, even if you're abroad. Like we talked about how food, you know, becomes so important. And then we also talked about like how important public transportation is, which is sort of like literally the vehicles to our freedom. <laughs> yeah, where we get to, you know, explore our queerness and explore this new place, which we might call home. He shares his contrasting experience as a member of the LGBTIQ community in two different Southeast Asian countries. The way I see it is like I'm a museum. So the way you see me or not depends if you visit. It's very weird because I'm Malaysian, so I have family and friends back in Malaysia, and I'm not really out to them per se, except for a few of them. But you know, when in Singapore, I don't really hide it. So I'm very, very lucky to have people who give me the space to be myself and not judge me for it. It's very weird because I've been in Singapore for seven years already and I only began to explore my queerness and my sexuality and my gender identity and the way I see the world when I first studied here in Singapore. So it's a very weird experience because I consider myself liberated from the stigma and the discrimination, I guess. Yeah, it can be very confusing. In Journeying Between the Lines, the event that I hosted, the Southeast Asian Queer Cultural Festival, where we talk about the experiences of queer migrants, where, you know, belonging is such an important theme. It's the very question that we ask ourselves every day because we're not home. So there's this term called entangled intimacies by Dr. Kwa. So even as we are away from our families, we still love them. But if we are with our family, we won't be the version that we want to be. I'm more in tune in Singapore's queer community than in Malaysia's. Like, I can't even name a single gay bar in Malaysia, in my hometown of Kota Kinabalu or in Kuala Lumpur, the capital. So I can't really comment on like, how it's like being a queer person in Malaysia. 
uh, other than that, you know, there's a recent case in Malaysia now that uh, where the federal courts upheld like the constitutional protections for queer people in Selangor. But other than that, you know, I'm not really sure if people feel safe. And especially in Malaysia, it's quite a big country in the sense that we have, what, 14 or 15 states? And we have 26 million people and every city, every town is different. As for my experience in Singapore, I feel like there's a certain sense of boldness in the queer community in Singapore. There's a spirit to it. Like, it's a very strong spirit. I think people here are actually quite unafraid, especially the queer artists in Singapore. I think they have a lot of boldness and the way they see the world, they're not afraid of being who they are. And even if the state imposes some sort of control in one form or another, they manage to overcome it in small ways and in big ways. Especially, you know, there's this um, recent protest for transgender people in school. And this is only four or five people, but in and of itself, it's a courageous move. Especially in Singapore, when there's a lot of sanctions and restrictions, both very subtle and very overt forms of sanctions and restrictions in expressing yourself. That's how I see the queer community here in Singapore. I think the biggest challenge is in a sense, convincing the state that equality is important. There's a lot of us going on around like Section 377A about like repealing that section in Singapore's penal code. For me, that's the first step in ensuring gender equality in Singapore because you give people the legitimacy of the state by the state. I think that's one way to tackle being seen and being heard and being understood by the people. And another thing is religious conservatism. Like my point of view, you know, I could be wrong. The church and the state in Singapore, it feels quite entwined. So how do we get people to hear us that, you know, we need protection from the law and not just saying that, you know, we don't enforce Section 377A, you know where we get legitimate protection under the law and legitimate equality in terms of like be it social aid or healthcare. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we have now. I think it's improving, you know, they, there's always two steps forward and three steps back. In Singapore, that's what they always say. That's what I always hear. You hear Singapore government, you know, being open to LGBTQ, like queer tech talents to come to Singapore and work. But there's still this question of marriage equality in, in Singapore when it comes to queer people. And they haven't addressed that. They haven't addressed Section 377A. And it's such an archaic law. It comes from like the British penal code system back in the colonial days. I think that's one of the biggest challenges to have that kind of, in one word, visibility, the same visibility afforded to heteronormative people in Singapore. I think that's very important. As a writer, Benedict believes telling brave stories can shed light on the issues and help improve the situation of the LGBTIQ community. It started from when I was very, very young, telling stories. And as long as you keep telling stories and you keep cataloging different types of lived experiences, you know, which is what the whole festival is about, right? It's about collecting memories and collecting experiences and collecting stories. I think it makes a difference because at least there's a record of it. There's an archive of it. And even if it doesn't change now, you know, in, we'll never know who it might inspire in the future. So I think literature and the art is so important that we tell these stories. And I think that boldness itself to ask difficult questions, to portray difficult stories and difficult ideas and difficult experiences as they are, it's so important. I remember there was this play about Paddy Chu the first person in Singapore that admitted that he was HIV positive. So there was a play that he also created in conjunction with one of the theatres in Singapore. I think it's called The Necessary Stage. You know, I think one of the first few scenes, even the first video, the introduction to the play, you know, if I'm not wrong, it shows him in a hospital bed because of his HIV. And then by having that courage to portray that, to show that in the 1990s, the 1980s, you know, when there was still a lot of stigma and discrimination when it comes to HIV. And that's one of the most important examples where I think that boldness really did help give a different perspective to the public. And 
it's quite important that the general public, every one of us, you know, to understand different points of view and different narratives outside of our own. And I think another thing that I feel like it's important is that everybody listens. Even if you disagree on a certain point of view or a certain quote-unquote way of life, I can only hope to inspire people to be empathetic and to have the wisdom to see from a different point of view and have the patience for nuance. So to have that patience to slow down to and listen, I think for me that's the biggest lesson that I want to impart to my readers. Through historical literature and stories, Benedict believes we can realize that the LGBTIQ community has always belonged to the Southeast Asian region. I think in my experience at least, you know, creating work for uh, SEAQCF and this theme actually really did help me illuminate that idea in a sense that I think by revisiting narratives, queer narratives from before, like in the past, we have so many examples of more nuanced gender identities throughout Southeast Asia. For example, in the Ibanis, there are the Manambali shamans. So for those shamans, you know, the male are supposed to undergo a sex change and become female in order to fulfill that role. So it's a very revered position in their culture. And we really have that reverence for femininity in Southeast Asia back then. So I think by revisiting queer narratives of pre-colonial times, I think that will help us create that solidarity. And I feel like even now, there's actually a solidarity. When marriage equality was passed in Taiwan, you know, outside of Southeast Asia, you know, in Thailand, you know, we feel connected to those experiences. We feel like we can celebrate with them. There were people sharing about it and celebrating it. So I think we already have that solidarity, but we can strengthen it, you know, by revisiting our past and revisiting who we were Back then, I think that's a very, very powerful tool that you can unite us queer people across nations and across boundaries. I definitely have hope. I have a lot of hope. I'm a very idealistic person at heart. And I know things are difficult now, but there's a long way to go in Singapore. There's a long, long way to go because it's very difficult, especially when the state and the government is so strong. But I have hope because I believe that people are understanding. I believe that there is empathy, there is kindness, there is wisdom. in not only Singaporeans, but in Malaysians and in Southeast Asia. Because, you know, we have so many avenues to access information and knowledge and different points of view. And I feel like the moment we have the wisdom to listen, you know, as I mentioned, to listen. I think just by listening itself and by continuing to telling stories, I have a lot of hope. To listen to more Belongings podcast episodes, follow the ASEAN Soji Caucus on Facebook or Twitter at ASEAN Soji and on Instagram at ASEAN Soji Caucus. This podcast is released under a Creative Commons license.